Amen, amen, amen. What a great, great song. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And today we are continuing in our immersaries with a message from the prophet of Ezekiel. We had part one last week, part two this week, and the message is entitled Restored, Restored. Now we have a history of humanity that is a history of conflict. And we have to see this as we look at Ezekiel and what's happening with Israel and Babylon and all those things. But we see conflict today, right? Everywhere we see conflict between individuals, families, clans, tribes, villages, cities, nations, empires. There's no place in the history of the world where you don't have conflict from the beginning in the garden when Satan came in and tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell into sin, and then Cain killed Abel. Abel, it has continued on. Some people have this kind of naive idea that, well, those are the bad people and those are the good people, as if some group of people is holy and righteous. And apart from Christ, we're not holy and righteous. And we see depravity, we see conflict, we see violence and injustice in, in cultures and societies around the world throughout all of history. And this conflict is fueled by a desire for power, a desire for possessions, a desire for personal gratification at all costs. It's fueled by anger. It's fueled by a desire for vengeance against others. It's also causes people to um, be the victim, to be the one to draw attention to themselves so that they get this power, the attention they want, and divert it from those who may truly be suffering in this world. It's rooted in sin. And soon, and sin is rooted in the selfish desire of people. In the context of our study, we're looking at the Babylonian Empire. And at one level, this is simply a war among nations. We're talking about Judah. Judah is a small kingdom in the Middle East. It was what was left over after the northern kingdom was taken into Assyria. And the kingdom is divided after they had been united under Saul and David and Solomon. And if you look at the history, what do you see? You see people fighting against people. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Nations against nations. And all of this is going on. So at one level, from a historical level, you have a superpower, Babylon, conquering other nations. Why? Because they want power. They want possessions. They want gratification. They want vengeance. They want to, to, to take out their anger on others. And they're simply conquering the peoples around them conquering Judah. And Babylon's not the only one. There was an Egyptian empire. Of course, there's the Assyrian empire, the Persian empire, the Greek empire of Alexander the Great, the Roman empire. There's the Mongol empire. There are Muslim empires, the Byzantine empire. There are empires in China, in India, in Africa, in the Americas. There are always empires of what? People fighting with people. People fight with people. Individually, together as families, as nations, as peoples, people fight. And here we're seeing that Judah is a victim of this conquest by Babylon. And a lot of issues come up here because there was this promise. There was a promise to Abraham and to his descendants that God would give them this land. And it would be their land, a land that was flowing with milk and honey, a land of peace, a land of shalom, a land of God's presence with them. And here, ten tribes have already been conquered and scattered, and two tribes are left with the temple, and Babylon is approaching. That dark cloud from the north is coming in against them. Something has gone terribly wrong. They aren't experiencing 
the promise. You know, everyone can look around the world today and think something is wrong, right? Something is wrong. I think today as we watch the news, as we watch television and the internet and see things happening, we think this is wrong. This is not right. It should not be this way. But why do we think it's wrong? Many people in the world today reject God. They reject Christ as Savior and Lord. He might be a good teacher or a prophet or somebody within their, their religious belief system, but He's not the Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't believe in a holy, just, righteous, and good God, then why is something wrong? You understand what I'm saying? It's called the problem of good. If there is no good God, if there is no good creation, if we're just here through naturalism, through, through chance, through evolution, through whatever the cosmos has produced, what's the basis for saying it's wrong? The basis is, I don't like it. That's the basis. It really comes down to, I don't like it. It shouldn't be this way. I want to get my way. I don't want to suffer. I should have what I want. And if I don't get it, and things aren't happening as I want them to happen, then it's wrong. But remember, if there is no God, there's no holy God behind this universe, besides your own opinion, your own feelings, what's the basis of right and wrong? What's the basis of good and bad? What's the basis of evil and righteousness? Why is my idea of right and wrong better than your idea of right and wrong? Why is their idea of right and wrong wrong, but their idea of right and wrong right? What's the basis besides power and opinion and personal desire? We have a problem because there was a promise. We have a problem because there is a God. We have a problem because God created the heavens and the earth and He created them good and things have fallen into sin and death has come into this world. And we know it's wrong. We know it's not right. And Israel and Judah knew something was wrong. And in Ezekiel and the other prophets, we get this behind-the-scenes commentary. It's not just a report that Babylon is building up their, their armories and their munitions and their chariots and their soldiers and they've got a plan to go and to conquer and to invade um, Judah. You can have that news story. And everybody would know what's going on around the world in that day, what's happening and the news would spread from city to city and place to place. Just like it spreads here about what's happening in Israel or what's happening in Ukraine or what's happening in some other part of the world. The news spreads and we say, oh, look what's happening there. But with Ezekiel, with Isaiah, with the prophets, we get a commentary from God. And God says, this is why this is happening. This is what is happening behind the scenes. We get a divine perspective on history. There's more going on than meets the eye. That's a very popular subject today, too, with all the conspiracy theories. And we have a lot of conspiracy theories. And there are things going on that, that, that are beyond what we see with our eyes. It doesn't mean that every conspiracy theory is right or wholly right or partly right or whatever. Just because you give an explanation for something doesn't mean the explanation is true. But we know there are things going on. And we know there are spiritual powers and institutional powers and people powers that are doing things behind the scenes. And I think one of the greatest schemes of our day is Jeffrey Epstein. The fact that none of those men who were with all those underage women have never been exposed shows you that there is a conspiracy among those people who went to that island. How do you keep it quiet, right? So there's people doing things. And we don't know all the things that are being done, but it's happening. But God pulls back the curtain and says, here is what is going on. In this book of Ezekiel, God is referred to as the Sovereign Lord 216 times. That's a lot, isn't it? What's he trying to say? All this is happening around you. 
But there is a sovereign God who transcends all these things and who is at work. And we may have our explanations about why and who and what, what should happen, what shouldn't happen, who's guilty, who's right, all those things. But God is sovereign, and He is holy, and He is righteous, and He brings judgment, not just on the foreigner, but even on His own people, Judah and Israel. Why? Because of sin. He says in Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He says that. I take no pleasure in that. But sin, turning from God, rejecting God, sinning against God, brings about what? It brings about death. In a very simple way, it brings about the death of relationships, the death of the quality of life, breakups and division and, and suffering in, in our own lives. But ultimately, it brings physical death and eternal death and separation from God. God is at work. He's not just a judge. He's also a God who loves and a God who promises redemption. So in every single prophet, as they come to warn, they warn for one reason. God wants you to turn back and to be saved. God wants you to experience what, what Terry read about in Peter today. God wants that for you. And you find it where? In God. In God. Ezekiel 7 2, it says, Son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Israel The end is here. Wherever you look, east, west, north, and south, your land is finished. Judgment was coming on Judah, on Jerusalem, on the temple. Why? We saw last week, because of the relationship of the people to God. They were idolaters actually in the temple. We went through that last week. The idol, idol of jealousy, the elders burning incense, the women mourning for Tammuz, the men worshiping the sun, all in the temple. They had turned their backs against God, literally bowing down to the sun with their back to God. They also came under judgment because of their sin against other people. We are to love God and love people, and they were turning from God and turning against people in violence, in murder, through injustice, and even child sacrifice. But that judgment was not just for Judah. We also see the judgment on the nations, in Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the other prophets. God's judgment comes because of sin, and it's a necessary judgment. Realize that. That judgment is, is built in. You can't sin against God and sin against what He has done and go against God's design and God's purpose and not have negative consequences. It doesn't work. Now we have the grace of God that's at operating, but this judgment is still there. Ezekiel 36, 5, it says, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, My jealous anger burns against these nations, especially Edom, because they have shown utter contempt for, my, for me by gleefully taking my land for themselves as plunder. So this is one of those statements of judgment on the nations. But he also promises restoration. The first part of the book is about judgment. The second part of the book is about restoration, that God will restore. And not just Israel, but bring restoration to the earth. Isaiah talks about that. Ezekiel talks about that. We saw it in the call of Abraham. Ezekiel focuses on the people of Israel, especially in Judah, Jerusalem, and at the temple, and those who have been scattered out of Judah, out of Assyria, out of, out of, into Assyria and Babylon and into the nations beyond. And he has a promise, a promise of restoration. And he talks about it in these ways. He says there will be a new shepherd a restored land, a restored people, an enemy that's defeated, a new temple, and a new city. Now we see these things going, well, wow. And everyone tries to figure all these things out. And um, be careful about who figures things out, because a lot of times when people figure things out, they're teaching things that the Bible doesn't teach, even if they're Christians. 
He says there'll be a new shepherd. Listen to what it says. It says, and I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them and be a shepherd to them. Now, he's not literally talking about David. He's talking about Jesus, the Messiah, the King, who will be on that throne. We know that from the Scripture. We know that from the ministry of Jesus Christ. The land will be restored. And when I bring you back, People will say, this former wasteland is now like the Garden of Eden. The abandoned and ruined cities now have strong walls and are filled with people. The people will be restored. We have the vision of dry bones where he says, speak a prophetic message to these bones, these skeletons in the valley and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am going to put breath into you and make you live again. Now in the immediate context, he's speaking to the exiles in Babylon that they will come back. But we know that there's more than just this. There's a new life, an eternal life that God has for us. The enemy will be defeated. In 39.4, you and your army and your allies will all die on the mountains. He's speaking of this enemy called Gog. The enemy from the north and the allies have come together to come against the people of God. And he says, you will all die. And I will feed you to the vultures and the wild animals. I said, why would God do that? Right? Why would he feed him to the vultures and wild animals? It's an image of war. When they went to battle, with their swords, their clubs, their knives, their spears, their arrows, and they slaughtered people on the battlefield, and people died in battle, do you think the victor went back and cleaned up all the bodies of everybody out there in the field? No, they let the animals do it. Or the people from who are defeated had to come and do that. It's a picture of war. It's a picture of defeat here. And God's enemies will be defeated. He says there will be a new temple. The Lord said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne. Talking about this temple that he had described to Ezekiel. And the place where I will rest my feet. He said, I will live here forever among the people of Israel. I will live here forever among the people of Israel. They said there will be a new city. And from that day, the name of the city will be the Lord is there. The Lord is there. So how are these prophecies fulfilled? How do they come to pass? We see them fulfilled in part and in some ways in history. But just reading through that, you can see that they've not been fulfilled to this day. Where's the temple where God is dwelling forever? It can only be with His people, right? He says there are promises of restorations, and we've seen fulfillments of these prophecies along the way in part. But we do not see the final and full fulfillment of these prophecies because they haven't come yet. But when Terry read from Peter, he was reading when they would come to pass, past when Christ returns. The nation of Israel, they rebuilt the um, temple in 516 B.C. They went into exile. The temple had been torn down. They came back and they rebuilt the temple. Some of you are reading right now about that rebuilding of the temple. And then in 336, guess what? Alexander the Great comes along and conquers the world. He, he rules over Israel. And then after he dies, the Ptolemies and Seleucids from Egypt and Syria, they rule over that area where Israel is. And eventually this guy named Antiochus IV comes in and he defiles the temple. And it's outrageous what has happened. And these are fulfillments of prophecy as well in Daniel. And then the Maccabeans, a group of Jews, they revolt against Antiochus and, and, and they win. And Judea, this place of Judea, is now reestablished there in the promised land. 
And Herod comes in and builds this great temple. He takes the temple there and he expands it and modifies it and makes it this great and glorious place. And then what happens? In 7 AD, that glorious temple is destroyed. Now we got commentary on that because Jesus said it would be destroyed. Why? They rejected the Messiah. They rejected Christ. We don't know what would have happened if the people had been faithful to God, faithful to the Messiah through all things. And then the people were scattered. At the time of Pentecost, this is a map that shows how people are scattered all over the place. Even though they had come back after the exile, even though they had come back in the first century, many Jews were still scattered throughout the world. They had not all come back into Israel yet. So we see a partial fulfillment, but not complete fulfillment. We have a promise that the land be restored and will be at peace. The people will have new hearts and new spirits, Ezekiel says. But where is the temple? Where is the city? Miraculously, the Jews today are back in the land, but we know these prophecies aren't fulfilled. There's no temple, there's no city. Their hearts haven't been changed, they still reject the Messiah. They're not living in peace. So we haven't seen the fulfillment of these things yet. So how will they be fulfilled? Well, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. If you want to know how prophecy will be fulfilled, you have to look to Jesus Christ because Jesus said that He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And Paul says that all the promises of God have been fulfilled in Christ. So when you wonder how will these things come to pass, don't go look for somebody out there who's going to tell you this happened today or that happened there and this is how all these things are come to be. Know that they're going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, when we see things happening, like Israel coming back into the land, that is consistent with the prophecies. That's consistent with what God is doing. That is a miraculous thing that has happened today, but it's not the full fulfillment of these things. He says, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to the glory of God. The promises are yes in Jesus Christ. So we have ourselves a divine commentary on what is happening in the world. And it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the teaching of Christ and His apostles in the New Testament. That is our divine commentary to understand what is happening and how we should respond and how we should live. You know, Ezekiel is full of visions, fantastical experiences. There are strange signs. There are signs all through this book. There's allegory. There's symbolism. Don't think that you've got to figure out what each one of these things means in a literal way and how it's going to be fulfilled because it's symbolic by nature. The book is symbolic. The book is about visions that he has about the future. And Paul says these promises will be filled in Jesus Christ. And the New Testament uses the same language to talk about the fulfillment of promises. It talks about a new shepherd. John 10, 14 through 16, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and know that Jesus knew Ezekiel by heart. He knew what Ezekiel had written. And he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, he says, I lay down my life for my sheep. These prophecies are going to be fulfilled through the sacrifice of Jesus the Son. He says, but as for my other sheep that are not from this sheep pen, the Gentiles, the others, I must bring them also and they must listen to my voice. Then what? There will be one flock and one shepherd. And that's a quote from Ezekiel. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Ezekiel's prophecies are being quoted by Jesus about himself. 
the land will be restored. Ezekiel 37, 25 says, They will live in the land I gave my servant Jacob, the land where their ancestors lived. They and their children and their grandchildren after them will live there forever. We know that didn't happen after the first return. We didn't know it didn't happen after the Maccabean revolt. So it still has to happen. And he says, my servant David, that's the king who rules on the throne of David, will be their prince forever. Who's that? It's Jesus. The, the, the prophets talk about the coming Messiah. Jesus said that he is the Messiah. Revelation 21.1 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new land. A new place where the people of God will dwell forever. For the first heaven and the first earth, what? Passed away. That means it did not last forever. And the promise is the land would last forever. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. The eternal fulfillment of God's prophecies are in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, it says, He has made known to us the mystery, that which was not revealed fully in the Old Testament, of His will according to His good pleasure, where? That He purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth. The people will be restored. Ezekiel 36, 26, And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. That's true restoration is when we are transformed. I will take away your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender and responsive heart. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Those prophecies are fulfilled in Christ who gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus what? Nicodemus was a Jew. Nicodemus was in the Sanhedrin. And he told Nicodemus when Nicodemus came to him at night, he said, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be what? Born again. Born again. The enemy will be defeated. We read in Revelation 19, 20-21, but the beast was taken prisoner, this false leader, along with the false prophet who performed signs in his presence. He deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword that came from the mouth of the rider on the horse. And that is Jesus, the Messiah, the returning king. And all the birds ate the fill of their flesh. Even as Ezekiel had prophesied, we read earlier. There will be a new temple. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, 10 to 14, that um, Jesus is the new priesthood. He's the new high priest. And it's a different priesthood. In Ezekiel, we read about these priests performing all the sacrifices. And I really see that as an idealized version of the temple and the sacrificial system. But Jesus said that he's the sacrifice. The Bible says that he's the priest. Listen to what Hebrews says about the sacrificial system. It says this. It says, By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. There's no coming again and again and again to present offerings. There's no priesthood coming where the priest is going to come again and again and again to present offerings for sin. It says once for all time. You don't get saved again and again and again and again. You don't get saved and sin and lose your salvation and get saved again. You get saved what once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. They were pointing towards Jesus. But this man, Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins 
forever sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. There's more to come. There's more to come. For by one offering, he has done what? Perfected forever those who are sanctified. You see, when you are saved by Jesus, you're saved. Yes, you may sin. Yes, you may fall. Yes, you may go astray. But He has saved you. And you're saved forever. Because that's what His sacrifice does. It saves you. It makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus. In Revelation 21, 22, it says, I did not see a temple in it, the new heaven and the new earth. Because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And he saw a new city. I saw also the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, adorned for her husband. That is the new city. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, is with people, and He will live with them. The book of Ezekiel ends with that word, the city, God is there. And Ezekiel said that is the place where God dwells. And Revelation says the place where God will dwell is where? In that new city, that new Jerusalem, in that new heaven, and that new earth where God will dwell with His people. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them and will be their God. We'll be restored. Now we're restored today in Christ. You've come to Christ. You're in Christ. You've been restored in your spirit. You're a new creation in Christ. But in this time of redemption, this time of salvation, this age of the gospel, We still live in this flesh, which will not inherit the kingdom of God. We still live in this world, which will not inherit the kingdom of God. But we're here on a mission. And that mission is to share the promise of restoration with others. That mission is to warn people with humility and with with broken hearts that there is judgment ahead for sin and that you want them to turn back and to turn to God and to be saved. We have a place here. Jesus said, Father, as you have sent me, I'm sending them. He said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. We're here on a mission, the mission of God. Let's stand together and pray. Father, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus and the insight, the commentary, the revelation that we have in him. And we pray, God, that we will be full of confidence and faith in you. We pray that we'll be faithful. And Father, we pray right now for anyone who is listening here in this building, online, or wherever, God, that when they hear the message of Christ, that if they don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, that right now, I call out to you right now, wherever you are, whoever you are, to say yes to Jesus. He is the one calling you. He is the one convicting you. He is the one loving you. He is the one who died and paid the penalty for your sin. So right now, I just urge you to say yes to Jesus. You do that in two basic ways. One, you confess your sin and ask for forgiveness. And two, you place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, receiving Him as Christ the Messiah. When you do that, the transformation takes place. God forgives you, and you become a new creation in Christ. And we rejoice with you. We're going to sing together this next song. O come to the altar. If you're a believer, come to the altar and and giving yourself afresh and anew to Christ in commitment and faith, receiving what God has for you. If you've never received Him and right now God is convicting you, come to the altar. You can come to the altar wherever you are. 
by bowing before God in his presence and receiving Christ.